Uh, it's great to be with you all on this beautiful boat, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed Emily Keeter this morning. She and I are going to be sort of alternating in the lectures. Emily's um, expertise is as an Egyptologist, which means that tomorrow um, she is going to be doing both of the lectures tomorrow because we want to make sure you're really stoked up on Egypt before we actually arrive there. And then I'll be coming back the next day and uh, giving some additional talks. Today we're going to start out with faith and culture in the ancient Near East. And I want to start out by explaining that term. When I had the abbreviation that I gave to Marius and others, I said faith and culture in the A-N-E. And they said, what is that? Well, the ancient Near East is what they call the Middle East when they're talking about ancient cultures. And the very, the very simple reason for that is that it used to be that the point of reference was from Greece. And from Greece, this is considered the Near East. When the reference moved to Western Europe, Rome especially, then it became the Middle East. So whenever you're talking about scholarly things about this part of the world, Arabia, Israel, the Levant, Turkey, they talk about the ancient Near East. So that's what we're going to get into a little bit today. Um, I first want to tell you who I am. Um, I am the director and senior lecturer for the Lakeside Institute of Theology in Mexico, where my wife and I live. Uh, I'm also the pastor of a Presbyterian church. My background in theology led me to teach historical theology. Whenever you start talking about religions, and I, I developed my expertise in world religions, you talk about religion, you have to talk about culture, which is why we're talking about faith and culture today. When you talk about culture, you have to talk about the history those cultures occurred in. So that's where I'm coming from in terms of my background, and, and the, this is the second time I've spoken on the Windstar Cruises on this kind of uh, subject. So today we want to get into how religion developed in the various cultures, and when you talk about the development of religion worldwide, you are talking about the Middle East, or the ancient Near East, more than any other single area. And uh, we're going to get into that. And let me tell you first the talks that I'm... Marius, this isn't working. Is he around? Marius? Hello? Yeah, see if you can find him if you would. Because... Oh, that will help. He's got an on switch. <laughs> Technical is not my expertise, I guess. Um, so these are the talks that I'm going to be giving. This is, does not include the talks that we're going to be hearing from Emily, and I'm excited about her talks. I, I, I turned it on. We're good. Um, today we're talking about faith and culture in the ancient Near East, and over the next 18 days, as Emily and I alternate, I'm going to be talking about um, the, uh, a topic called Alone in the Desert, Christian Monasticism and St. Catherine's Monastery so that you have some sort of background for not only the monastery, but what led to the astonishing monasteries that we have and why are they in Egypt, the Sinai. Then, Mysteries of the Nabataeans and the city of Petra. I'll be talking about Moses, the Israelites, and the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea. And I may, as an Egyptologist, I may have to give Emily an opportunity to, to counter me on some of that because you get into very different ideas about what happened back in that, in that time. Then, Children of Abraham, I'll be looking at uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All three of the great monotheistic religions in the world trace their roots back to one man, and that is Abraham. So we'll talk about that. Then Islam, what everyone should know. Most of you, unless you live in a large city where there's a, a, a Muslim community, you probably don't know a lot about Islam, and obviously we have a lot of questions because of the, the nature of the world today. Then Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and the British victory in the First World War. So that one's more for the guys. Uh, you know, if you're interested in the First World War and what went on there and how Lawrence of Arabia fit into all that, we'll talk about that. And then finally, history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East. Why is it so difficult for them to find a peaceful solution for the problems that occur in this region? Okay, so we'll be building up to that. I know some of you are, are leaving to go to Cairo from Luxor. The, the, Lectures that I give will be videotaped, they will be available online, we'll give you that information later in case you are going to be leaving and won't have a chance to hear these, all right? So, let's jump into the topic here. First, this is a list of the religions, the world religions, that exist based upon the date of founding. You will notice that the oldest of the religions is Hinduism, which comes from uh, the Indus Valley, which is Pakistan, India. Um, one of the oldest of the cultures in the world is the Indus Valley. 
We then have Judaism, the Jewish faith, which began in Palestine um, quite a bit later, 2000 BC. Buddhism, the, Christ, the Chinese traditional religions, which includes Confucianist, Confucianism, Taoism, shamanism, some of the others. And then Shinto, the national religion of Japan, uh, Jainism. Um, I'm not gonna be able to get into the Asian religions. We're not gonna deal with those, but I wanted you to have a sense of that. One thing that's very interesting about this you will notice that a number of what are considered the world religions all happened or started within a hundred years of each other. This is called the Axial Age, where you have Buddhism, the Chinese traditional religions, that is Taoism, Confucianism, Confucianism that's very hard to say, and Shinto and Jainism all happened within about a hundred years of each other. This is called the Axial Age. If, do we have any evolutionary biologists in the crowd? Okay. Well, the same thing happened in, in uh, the evolutionary biology, there are periods of time like the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago, where in a period, relatively short period of time, most of the animal phylum that we know about all occurred at once. Well, religion has been the same way. There have been bursts of religion, religious creativity down through history. So um, we're going to specially look at the religions that are, that had their founding in the Middle East, this is a list of the religions based upon size in the world today. Christianity is the world's largest religion, constituting just under 30% of the population, followed by Islam. Now, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Then Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. The religions that are marked here are the ones that are considered monotheistic, meaning they believe in one God. All of the others are polytheistic. And again, I'm only going to be able to concentrate really on the religions that are from the Middle East, but the monotheistic religions, all of them have their roots in the Middle East. Even um, Sikhism, although it is in India, Sikhism is sort of a, a merging or a melding of Islam, which did start in the Middle East, and Hinduism, which started from Asia. And Baha'i, although it came from Persia, it was because Persia was an Islamic country at that point. The headquarters, international headquarters for Baha'ism right now is in Haifa, Israel. Um, and so all of these monotheistic religions had their root in the Middle East, or more exactly, the ancient Near East. And so we're going to talk about some of those. Um, the specific religions we want to discuss today are first the primitive polytheisms of Mesopotamia. The word Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers. The land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which is uh, the area that we currently know as Iraq, and that was where civilization pretty much began. There's some disagreement whether it was the Mesopotamian region or Egypt was along the same time or the Indus River in Pakistan and western India, but the Mesopotamian primitive polytheism, then we want to talk about the Egyptian, I would call sophisticated polytheism, and I'll tell you why we, I believe there's a difference there. Then the Greek and Roman sophisticated polytheisms. Now, Greece and Rome are not in the Middle East, but the religions that came out of Greece and Rome, because both of those cultures were significantly influential, the Roman, in the Roman case, conquered all of this area, their religions were carried over. And then the ancient mystery religions, fascinating cluster of the religions that came out of Egypt and Persia especially, but affected the Western world. And then the rise of monotheism, that is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the uh, Abrahamic religions. So we're going to discuss how those came up. First, this is the part of the world that we're talking about. It is variously known as the Fertile Crescent, as you see here, it's because here are the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, and this area was fertile, which is why they call it the Fertile Crescent. Sometimes the map draws down into the Nile Delta. All of this is considered the Fertile Crescent. It is also called the Levant. Um, this area is the crossroads of the three most ancient parts of the world. If uh, there are some ancient maps that show Jerusalem with three lobes off of it. One lobe is Europe, one lobe is Asia, and one lobe is Africa. To communicate between the various cultures in those areas, they had to travel through this area, and that's why this has been the center of so much human activity down through the centuries, and millennia even. Now, this area here, uh, Çatal Hayek in Turkey, is considered by some, and this is fairly new, it was only really discovered in the 1950s and then left alone until 
<coughs> excuse me, the 90s, and they've continued to do work since then, that may be the oldest city. And there's again, there's dispute. You ask 10 experts and you get 10 different answers as to what the oldest city in the world is. Some people claim that the oldest city may be Jericho. Others say Aleppo in Syria, some say Damascus in Syria, but everyone has pretty much agreed that the first part of the world that we had a civilization in terms of a cluster of cities was in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, or ancient Sumeria. You'll notice several names there. Eridu um, is considered by some the oldest city. Uruk, Ur, Lagash, uh, all of those are various experts would claim those are the original city. Now, what do we mean by a city? A city was the place where people first settled down and, and became sedentary. They stopped traveling around nomadically. Um, it's where they first had a division of labor, where people were, you know, were paid for their expertise in making pots or weaving mats or whatever, instead of everybody having to be self-sufficient. Uh, it's where they had planted crops, domesticated animals, irrigation, the use of tools like the wheel. When people had those kinds of abilities, they started settling into cities. And civilization is defined by when people could gather together in cities and support themselves in a city. Um, now, as we talk about uh, the religions that grew up, the earliest religions we know about were in Sumeria in the Mesopotamian region. Again, Egypt very close behind. The Indus uh, River Valley civilization in Pakistan and Western India very close behind. And people will argue about that. But in the Sumerian religion, in the Fertile Crescent, there were literally hundreds of thousands of different deities. Uh, to give you some idea how that compares, Hinduism, the, the largest of the polytheistic religions, is estimated to have 300 million gods. And one of the reasons for that is because it is a, um, as a polytheistic religion, it really is pantheistic, which means everything is considered part of God. And so everything is just part of God that has a different name. So when we talk about polytheism, we're talking about enormous numbers of God in many cases. Um, here in the Fertile Crescent in the Sumerian area, the earliest polytheistic religions developed based upon people's experience of the natural world. Things that they could not understand or could not control, they ended up deifying in order to give it a name, in order to have some way to be able to understand it. Um, for example, this area you'll notice is a lowland and it is dominated by rivers. It was fertile and that's why they could, could uh, grow crops there and they could live in a settled environment. But that also meant that they were very much subject to natural disasters. Storms would occur in the uh, Zagros, the Zagros Mountains here, the Taurus Mountains here. The people in the lowlands could see storms occurring in the mountains, these horrendous storms. Now, we don't even think about this today, but what do you think was the loudest noise anybody ever heard of back in those days, before we had amplification? Thunder which is why some of the most powerful gods in the early polytheisms were seen as sky gods or thunder gods. And yet, that, that was how they tried to understand what was going on. And they also knew that once they saw those storms in the mountains, they frequently got these floods that killed people and destroyed things and washed away crops. And so they became concerned as to how can we keep those sky gods, those thunder gods, from doing the things that are causing us so much damage. The other kind of god, the two most powerful or most important kind, the sky gods, the thunder gods, the storm gods, the other kind was the fertility gods. In fact, the one that people related to most, they knew that if we don't have children, the tribe dies, and that was an issue of fertility. If the crops don't grow, then we don't eat and we die. That also was an issue of fertility. And so fertility gods and the sky or storm gods were the primary gods that people had to deal with. This image here at one time was thought to be the oldest human artifact. It is about 24,000 years old. Um, this is called the Venus of Willendorf, and it is one of tens of thousands of similar little uh, ceramic, or stone in some cases, dolls, that represent the fertility god. I, I, you know, I thought, does everybody's girlfriend look like that back then? I wasn't sure, but the idea is a fat woman 
perhaps pregnant, with pendulous breasts, represented fertility. It represented having enough food to eat. It represented being fertile and having children. Now, again, there are tens of thousands of these things that have been found all over ancient digs from Austria to Siberia. Um, this is from Chatel Hayek, which again, some people believe may be one of the oldest cities. Um, she's actually giving birth on her throne there and representing the mother goddess, as she was called, the fertility goddess. We also have in temples around the world, we found all of the, they have found all of these uh, images of people worshiping. The interesting thing is that, as best we can tell, people were building temples as some of the very earliest buildings they ever had. Even before they were building houses, apparently they were building places of worship. And so we find these kinds of images in them. Um, this is a Sumerian um, relief that represents several different deities. And you'll notice that one of the deities is coming up out of the river. The river both provided water, which was necessary for the plants to grow, and it also, there was a fear associated with it because of the damage, and so they deified the rivers as well. Um, in Sumeria, Mesopotamia, they also deified some strange things like mud. They did not have stone in the Mesopotamian region like they had in Egypt and other areas. The ziggurats, the tall buildings, the temples that they built were made out of mud bricks. And so mud became even a deified thing to them. Now, I expect everyone to memorize this chart. <laughs> this gives you some idea why I call the polytheism of ancient Sumeria and Mesopotamia uh, a primitive one, because if you took a few minutes to look at this kind of genealogy, there are, there are names that appear, you know, a, a person's grand, great-grandparents, according to this, are the same as their great-great-grandchildren. It's very confused, uh, appropriate to this kind of chart. Particularly, though, you would notice that the Namu is the mother goddess, the goddess of fertility, one of the primary gods. The, um, the consort of the mother goddess is the storm god, or the sky god. And so you see everything descending from these two specific deities. Um, as we continue, you may recognize the name Marduk. Marduk became the chief deity of Babylon. And Marduk, an interesting story, in the Enuma Elish, which is the ancient Babylonian creation epic, Marduk ended up doing battle with his great-great-grandmother, Tiamat. Tiamat and her husband had children who had children, and the grandchildren made so much noise that Tiamat and Absu, her consort husband, couldn't sleep. So they decided to kill their great-grandchildren. Their great-grandchildren uh, made arrangements for Marduk to destroy them. Absu is killed and his blood is mixed with clay to make people, humans, to be slaves so the gods didn't have to do any work. And Tiamat is torn apart by Marduk and her body is used to create the sky and the horizon and the earth. This is the creation epic of the Enuma Elish, one of the oldest human documents. The interesting thing is, whereas the Jewish and Christian religion, for instance, and Islam starts out assuming that God existed. All of the ancient polytheistic religions started out trying to explain where the gods came from and then how everything else got created. It's a very different kind of understanding. A couple of other names you might recognize, Gilgamesh and Ishtar. Gilgamesh, the Gilgamesh epic, is again one of the oldest known pieces of human literature. It's the story of Gilgamesh and his, his close friend in Kidu, they, they start out fighting each other and then they become friends and then it turns into a buddy movie. They're drinking <laughs> together and they're fighting together and they're doing all sorts of things. And then um, Enkidu dies. The other gods get upset, they kill him. And the whole rest of the Gilgamesh epic is Gilgamesh trying to discover the meaning of life and how life can be extended. And the final conclusion he has is that human life will end but cities will remain. It is basically a praise of cities, of civilization. Um, and again, one of the oldest epics that we have. And then the other circle there, Ishtar, you've probably heard of Ishtar. She became a primary god in Babylon and other of the uh, civilizations. The Ishtar Gate, um, which was taken from this part of the world, from Mesopotamia, is now in the Berlin Museum, of all things. You know, And it's an extraordinary, colorful relief uh, work. You'll see Abzu up there and um, Inki. They are the gods of, of water. 
And then I mentioned to you Lamt and Lahamu are the gods of mud. So these were all parts of the beliefs of the ancient Sumerians, the most ancient of the polyistic re religions. Now, we then come to Egypt. I am not going to say much about Egypt because I have an Egyptologist sitting in the back row back there, and I want to be very careful about that. Tomorrow morning, Emily is going to be talking about the religion of Egypt, and she, in fact, quite literally wrote the book on the religions of Egypt. So she's going to talk more about that. But I can't talk about the development of religion and culture, faith and culture, without at least mentioning it. Um, Egypt was much more sophisticated in their religious understanding and their polytheism than Mesopotamia, partly because they had a lot longer to sort it out. Um, the Egyptian history is the longest history that exists anywhere on the planet, whereas in Mesopotamia you had the Sumerians were conquered by the Akkadians, who were conquered by the Hittites, who were conquered by the Babylonians, who were conquered by the Assyrians. And so even though they adopted some of the gods that came before them, there was a stop and start thing that happened over and over again. Whereas in Egypt, there was a continuous history since the third millennium BC. <laughs> and so the idea of the divinities that came along during that time were much better developed. Um, the, the kingdom periods, which I know we're gonna get into as Emily talks about that, uh, we saw development now in, in every case though we still have the gods related to natural phenomena of various kinds for instance the god set who was the god of chaos was also the god of the desert because egypt was only three percent habitable the rest of it was desert the area along the nile river was the only part people could live in and so set was the god of the area outside the chaos away from the nile river which was the desert, and therefore the god of death as well. Um, you get uh, gods like the sky god Horus, who was especially related to the pharaohs, who were considered semi-divine, um, and on and on. And, and Emily will get into a lot of details about that. It's very important for us to realize the history of Egypt because the Egyptian history gives us a point of reference for every other history in the ancient world. For instance, in the Egyptian record, when they said we fought a battle and defeated Ashurbanipal, who was an Assyrian, we know when Ashurbanipal was because it's part of the continuous history we have written of the Egyptians. And so the Egyptian timeline is critical for understanding everything else. Um, we have very clear images. Unlike the case with the Mesopotamians, this is, this is uh, much more sophisticated. We have images. Uh, Emily mentioned this morning about the, the dog-headed god that they dress up. We actually like Anubis, the dog-headed god, because my wife and I have Basinjis, which are African dogs that were the, the dogs of the ancient pharaohs. And they look like uh, Anubis. But all of these different gods very clear images of them. As you can see, Horus, Set, Thoth, uh, various others, Osiris, Isis, and you can even buy action figures. I meant to ask you, Emily, if you have any of the Egyptian god action figures. Do you? <laughs> um, so very clearly defined uh, theology, polytheism, in the Egyptian world. One of the very interesting things that happened in the Egyptian history uh, of religion had to do with this is on the left hand side Nefertiti, on the right hand side uh, Amenhotep IV, who also took the name, or later took the name, Akhenaten. Um, Amenhotep IV's father, Amenhotep III, we're talking about the 14th century BC, the New Kingdom. Uh, Amenhotep III decided he really liked the god Aten. Aten was related to Ra. You all know Ra, right? Carolyn's favorite bumper sticker is Isis, Isis, Ra, Ra, Ra. Um, okay, maybe glad you understood. Glad you laughed at that. Um, well, Ra, the manifestation of Ra, called the disk of the sun, was considered a god Aten. In other words, the Ra, the sun god. But then the warmth you felt, the light you felt, the disk of the sun was considered a separate deity, related to, but separate from, and that was Aten. Amenhotep III really liked Aten, and he set up a special uh, group of priests and temples in the city of Amarna. Well, when his son came along, Amenhotep IV, he liked Aten so much, he tried to make Aten the only god in Egypt. And because he was the pharaoh, he was successful during his life. When he died, they went back to the old way, but this was not very popular because the priests of all the other deities you know, didn't like it that they were being suppressed. But this idea of 
a monotheism coming in the 14th century BC in Egypt is fascinating. But it's not actually monotheism so much as it is henotheism. You may not be familiar with that term. Henotheism means there are multiple gods that you could worship, but you pick one. And this actually that, that is your god, the one you're going to worship. And this actually was the way it was in much of the ancient world. Every city had a favorite deity. Athens, do you know what the god of Athens was? Yeah. Athena. That's what the whole Acropolis and Parthenon was all about. Um, you have Artemis of the Ephesians in the city of Ephesus, if you've ever been there. Um, and so every city, and many times even families, had their favorite gods. Henotheism means you pick the one you're going to worship, but you don't deny that there are others that exist. Ancient Judaism actually probably began as a henotheistic religion. You, will, you, you know the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is you will have no other gods before me. It doesn't say there aren't any other gods. It says you won't have any others before me. And the second of the Ten Commandments is you will create no graven images. And so the idea is early on, even the, you know, the early Jewish people, the pre-Moses Jewish people, probably believed in multiple deities, but they decided there was one that was really worth, worthy of worship. And so henotheism is what we call that. This is an image of Amenhotep IV, or Akhenaten is the name that he took. Akhenaten means uh, efficient for Aten, or working for Aten. Now, and Emily, you have my full permission to correct anything to the, that I've said today when you, when you do your section tomorrow. We then turn to Greece, and again, Greece is not considered part of the ancient Near East, but it had so much influence, we have to pay some attention to that. The, the polytheism of Greece was very much more sophisticated than anything even we had seen before in terms of the images because it was more humanized. You didn't have gods with dogs heads or other things like that. They were all quite human. The earliest of the Greek civilizations was Manoa. The island of Crete was the Minoan civilization. And from there, you'll see some dates up here, 1700-1450 BC, <coughs> And the Mycenaean civilization began around 1450. That was really the first developed Greek city-state. And when we think about Greece, we think about a country. But in those days, they were cities. And each city was an independent uh, entity, a national entity, if you will, of itself. And the Mycenaeans developed belief in some of the same gods that later got transferred to the other Greek city-states. For instance, their chief god in My uh, Mycenae was Poseidon which is, Poseidon was, you know, the god of the seas, right? Uh, well, why do you think that the Mycenaeans were interested in the sea? Because obviously that was a major influence for them. They were surrounded by it. Poseidon later got adopted as one of the chief gods in the other Greek, um, when they considered the other deities in the rest of Greece. You'll notice this blue star here is Athens. All of this yellow is the Athenian Empire. Um, Athens, once they defeated um, the, the city of Troy, <coughs> up in here, and they continually fought against the Persians. In fact, one of the first real histories, as we understand history, that was ever written by Herodotus in the 400s BC was about the war between the Greeks and the Persians. And Athens was the leader in that. And so, they began to spread their belief in their deities, this area, and then later on, when the Greek culture spread further, then many more people adopted it. Um, this is an image of the Greek pantheon. They had the 12 senior gods that lived on Mount Olympus. They were Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, Artemis, Aphrodite, Ares, Hera, Demeter, Athena, Hermes, Hephaestus, and Dionysus. All of them were very human in their characteristics, as you can see. Um, this is a typical view of what the Greek gods would have looked like as they laid around and played around on Mount Olympus. Now, the thing about the Greek gods is that humans could not approach them and have relationships with them or be friendly with them. Now, the gods could approach humans and have relationships with them, which they often did in very, very literal ways. Uh, Hercules, for instance, what was known to the Greeks as Heracles, was, was the son of the great god Zeus, and a woman, Alamene. And so it was possible for the gods to have intercourse with humans and bear children, but only when the gods wanted to. People did not have the power to approach these gods in the same way. Now, 
We said that the Greek gods were pretty isolated to Greece until the coming of, uh, oh, I skipped one here. Th these are some of the temples. Uh, the idea of the standard Greek temple, this is a model of the temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, this, of course, is the Acropolis and the Parthenon, a close-up of the Parthenon. So temples, Greek temples, when somebody thinks about ancient Greece, they probably either think of a temple or they think of a naked guy with a discus, right? Um, because this was so much the, simple, the symbol of what ancient Greece was all about. And then we have Alexander the Great, and they call him the Great for a reason. Alexander conquered virtually all of the known world at that point, and, and, and he died when he was 32. You know, the old saying is, by the time Alexander the Great was my age, he'd been dead for 26 years, okay? <laughs> Alexander was not actually Greek, because in those days, Macedon was a different country, or Macedonia was a different country than Greece. Philip of uh, Macedonia, probably the most underrated historical figure any time, uh, the father of Alexander, the one who built the military, designed the strategies for the military that Alexander then took over, the idea being that they wanted to defeat the Persians. They conquered all of um, the Greek peninsula, crossed over, and with an army that was a fraction the size of the Persian armies, I mean literally, you know, one-fourth to one-fifth the size, Alexander never lost a battle. He marched through Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey, down through the Levant, through Israel, and by the way, like so many other rulers down through time, he did not bother the, the Jewish people that lived in Israel at that time because they marched out to meet him and they said, by the way, Alexander, here in our book of Daniel, in our, in our holy writing, it talks about the leader from the West who will come and defeat the Persians. And Alexander went, cool. I'm here. And so he left them alone, as did later Julius Caesar and other major leaders. But Alexander then marched down into Egypt. There had always been a story um, that perhaps Alexander was more than just a human, and he apparently began to believe this. His mother, Olympia, told him as a child that, that Zeus had come to her at night and that he was actually not the son of Philip of Macedon, but rather that he was the son of Zeus. Well, he started believing it, especially when he's winning these battles against armies much bigger than his. When he gets down to Egypt, they welcome him as semi-divine, as practically as a deity, because the pharaohs, the leaders, were seen that way. You'll notice this little, whoops, this little knob here, where this is a location out in the desert called Siwa. That was the location very remote of the temple to Zeus Ammon. It was sort of a combination of the Greek god and the, um, the Egyptian deity. Well, Alexander makes a pilgrimage there and the oracle at Siwa tells him that he is divine, that he is the son of Zeus Ammon, and he claims that for himself. His troops got kind of tired of him acting like a god, but that was the way that it happened. He left there, he travels all the way back up through the Levant, over into modern day Iraq, Afghanistan, all the way over to the western end of India. And he never lost a battle, and he defeated every army they came up against. He gets that far and he wants to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean, the Great Waters. And it was 11 years they'd been on the march. And his troops go, Al, 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 we want to go home. And so they refused to follow him any further, and they had to come back. He got back as far as Babylon, which is where he died at 32. Okay. Um, and as Emily mentioned this morning, after that, the various generals that he had, he did not name a successor before his death, they split up the entire empire that he had created by all of these victories between the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, and others. And so that's where you get some of the names that, that occur in history after that. That's, it was called the War of the Diadochi because they fought battles against each other to see who got to run things. This is the Roman Empire, which is the next big thing to come along after Alexander the Great. Um, again, as Emily said, the Mediterranean Sea was considered the Roman lake at that point. They controlled all of it, this whole orange area was the Roman Empire by the first century AD. Um, and as a result of that, the Roman deities became the primary focus. Now, this is an image of the Roman deities. Does that look familiar to you at all? 
it looks very much like the image of the Greek deities because the Romans were not were nothing if not efficient. They practiced a kind of syncretism, as it's called, which meant they accepted all other deities. They would take over a land and they go, well, who do you worship? And they go, well, we worship Hera or whatever. And they go, well, that's cool. We'll add her to our list. And that syncretism meant they were prepared to take on any deity that came along and add them. In fact, you end up with a parallel between the Roman deities and the Greek deities. There's an exact sort of lining up in most of the major deities. Zeus of the Greeks was the same as Jupiter of the Romans. Hera and Juno were their wives, Aphrodite and Venus, Ares and Mars. They accepted all of these. In fact, this is the reason why later on the Romans had so much trouble with the Christian faith when it came along. The Jews got a pass because Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar really liked them and gave them permission not to do emperor worship. But when the Christians come along, who were not covered under the Jewish um, exception, then they, the Romans were saying, why don't you worship our gods? Why don't you do emperor worship? And they said, because we don't believe in your gods, we only believe in one god, and that's the reason why there was so much persecution of the Christians early on, because the Romans would accept whatever deities were out there, and sort of take them in and make them pets, and everything was good. But that's not something that was understood by the, and they, the Jews or the Christians. They were exceptions to that. You will notice a similarity also between the temple structures. The Roman temples looked very much like the Greek temples. The only difference was the, Ro the Greek temples tended to be open. You know, like between the pillars, it was all open other than statues. Whereas the Romans wanted to get out of the weather. They would put a box inside it. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. The big difference between the Greeks and the Romans is, of course, the arch. One of the things that made the Romans so, um, so successful in conquering the world was the fact that unlike the Greeks, the Romans invented the arch, which means they could build bridges that the, that the Greeks couldn't. They could have aqueducts to carry water. The Greeks never invented the arch. So everything they had was limited in strength because of the way they had to build things. But the temples still had a lot of similarity between them. <coughs> we then find a fascinating period of time in which we had something called the mystery religions. I mentioned to you the fact that the, um, the Greek gods, people could not feel like, they didn't feel like they could relate to them. You couldn't approach them. You couldn't have a relationship with those gods unless the gods decided that you were pretty enough they wanted to have a relationship with you or that they were going to do mean things to you and see how you acted, like you know, ants on a hot plate. Well, there was a real desire on the part of people to feel a different kind of relationship with the gods they worshipped. And the Greek gods and Roman gods both were very much distant. And so we developed this idea, or they developed this idea, of the mystery religions. These, for the most part, came from Egypt or Persia originally. And they were different because, for one thing, they weren't available to just everybody. Only initiates, this appeal to the, um, to the exceptional, okay? Not everybody's going to understand this, but we're sure you're one who can. And people were secret initiates. In fact, we really don't know a lot about these because they were secretive. They didn't write these things down. It's very difficult for us to reconstruct some of this. But the idea that they were exclusive, they were heavily ritualistic, and they promised kind of a mythical awakening, that you could actually experience your religion in terms of a feeling, a spiritual development in yourself that was not available in some of the other religions. They were exotic. Again, they were from Persia and Egypt primarily, or at least adaptations from those places. Um, they offered something, a, a version of immortality or afterlife that the Greek and Roman gods did not. Now, Egypt did have an afterlife. That's why mummification. And one of the reasons the Egyptians developed that sense is because of the cycle that they lived in with the Nile every year. Of course, the Nile floods, it leaves deposits of fertile soil so that you can grow crops. That cycle of, um, it, of the Nile River gave them a sense that there is life, and then there is a dying, and then there's a return. So the Egyptians had an idea of an afterlife, but the Romans and Greeks didn't. The mystery religions gave them a sense that there was an afterlife, that they might be able to have immortality. Um, and they, they were religions that encouraged relationship not only between um, individuals, or not only between the gods and the people, but also between individuals who were part of it. Um, when you participated in a Mithraic, for instance, um, a service, a cultic kind of festival, 
you took off your clothes, you put on special robes, and everybody was dressed the same, and a slave could be standing next to a Roman senator, and no one would know the difference. There was an equality, a fellowship that occurred there. Some of the, the various mystery religions, the cult of Sibylle. Sibylle is the modernized version of the mother goddess. Remember the little fat clay figure? Sibylle was the mystery religion version of the mother goddess, the goddess of fertility. Her consort, Attis, the Mithraic mysteries, Mithra was a Persian war god. And so the, the Roman military especially liked him. You had um, Isis, Dionysus, the Eleusian mysteries, Orphic mysteries, the cult of Serapis. All of these were more intimate and friendly than any of the religions they'd had before. Here you have Mithra um, killing a bull. This was the, the Tarabolium, it was called, was the primary cultic ritual of the Mithraic cult. And they had sort of a, a weird macabre baptism. The new initiates would be brought into a cave and over their head was a grate, a metal grate. They would lead a bull in over that grate and cut the bull's throat. And as the blood poured down on you, you had a baptism in blood which made you an initiate into Mithraism. Um, there was a time when Mithraism was so popular amongst the Roman army that it was a primary competitor for Christianity because it was during the same times. Um, you have, uh, among these others, I Isis. Push the wrong button here. Isis. Isis was considered the goddess who was the friend of slaves, of sinners, of artists, of children. Serapis, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, was intended to unify sort of Greek and Egyptian religions. Attis. Um, lower left was associated with Helios, the Greek god of the sun. Uh, Sibylle, as I mentioned, much more sophisticated look, but Sibylle, the mother goddess, was exactly the same as this figure from Mesopotamia in terms of their understanding, um, just a development of it. Now, let's talk for a few minutes about monotheism. Monotheism um, or it's usually referred to as ethical monotheism, and the reason for that is because none of the prior religions really focused on an ethical behavior. None of them talked about the fact that you need to not lie or steal or kill or commit adultery. When monotheism comes along, first in the form of Judaism, it was strongly ethical in its presentation. Now, whereas polytheism was primarily a response to people's perception about nature, they would hear the thunder, they would experience the flood, and they were trying to get a grasp on what all of that was about and what caused it. Monotheism was perceived as a revealed rather than a perceived religion, which means the monotheistic religions were seen that God, the one God, came and revealed himself rather than just them perceiving it as they went along, which is a fundamental difference. Um, now, let's talk about Jewish monotheism. Around Whenever you see a C, that means circa. That means best as we know, or about. So about the year 2091, God, according to the Jewish faith, speaks to Abram. This is in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as the Christians call it. God speaks to Abram, who later would be renamed Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means the father of many because one of the promises God made him is you will be the father of many people. And they, God calls Abram to follow him. Get up and go where I take you and I will be your God and you will be the father of my people. I will bless all peoples of the world through you and I will give you a land to call your own. That was the promise. So Abram started out in Ur, one of the oldest of the cities in Mesopotamia. He traveled up to Haran, here, which is where his father died, and then down into Palestine, the Levant, through the Levant, had a sojourn into Egypt and then came back. So that's the start of the Hebrew people who, knew the, who saw themselves, were told that they were the people of God. This is how the Jewish people started. Then, about 600 years later, around 446, and this is where you get a dispute because some people say it was in the 1200s, depending upon which pharaoh you think was in charge at the time, and some people say it didn't happen at all. We'll talk about that later because one of my talks is going to be the children of Abraham and then also Moses and the Exodus. But around 446 BC, God calls Moses out of the wilderness where he was keeping his father-in-law's sheep and goats, 
to come back to Egypt, where the Israelites were in captivity as slaves, and lead them out of captivity. After they left Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai, and there's a serious question as to where Mount Sinai was. We'll talk about that too, even though we're going to visit the traditional Mount Sinai in St. Catherine's Monastery. They came out of captivity, and at Mount Sinai, God gave the law to the Jewish people through Moses. So whereas Abraham started the people of Israel, or the, the Hebrew people, the religion of Judaism began with Moses, the, the one who received the law, and that was about 1446 or so. Then, this is, this is some ideas as to where the Exodus may have happened when they left uh, Egypt, but there are people who disagree and say it looked like this, and so this is an ad for the talk on the Exodus, so you all can come <laughs> back and, and we'll discuss those options. The thing that God gave to Moses was the Torah, the law, or instruction is probably a better word. The Hebrew Bible later on, were add, they added the prophetic writings called the Nevaim, and then later the Ketuvim, or the general writings, like the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, etc. The three of those sections together, the Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim, they take those three words and they crunch them together to create a sort of an acronym of a word, Tanakh. And Tanakh is the common name for the Hebrew Bible. So the Tanakh, down below here, you can see uh, in the traditional scroll coverings, this is written Hebrew from right to left. It has no vowels. It is written as one long stream, as Arabic, Aramaic, and a lot of ancient languages are. So this was the Hebrew Bible, starting with the Torah that was given to Moses. Then the third major event in the Jewish, the formation of the Jewish religion and the Jewish people was around 1000 BC or 1010. God first through the prophet Samuel called the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel was uh, Saul. Saul didn't do a very good job. He got ousted. God got rid of him and called David who became the great king of Israel. If you want to understand the history of the Jewish people and of the Jewish religion, these are the three primary characters you need to understand. There was Abraham, originally called Abram, who started the people by God's call. Then there was Moses, the lawgiver, to whom God gave the religion of, of, is, of the Jewish people. And then thirdly, the great king who formed them as a nation, which is King David, and then later his son Solomon. This was what the United Kingdom of Israel looked like under David and then his son Solomon. Uh, they grew even more under Solomon. They actually were, from a financial point of view, uh, quite, you know, quite the thing. People were traveling from all over because of the wealth of King Solomon and the wealth of this kingdom. Fortunately, at this time, there were not a lot of other major powers to threaten them. The Hittites were in the north, up in what we call Turkey, what was then Asia Minor. You had the Phoenicians along the coast here, but other than that, there was a period of time under David and Solomon when there weren't. The Babylonians were not bothering them. For the most part, the Egyptians were not coming north. The Assyrians hadn't come along yet, so they grew as a kingdom around 1000 BC and following. So King Solomon dies around 930 BC, and the kingdom is split in two because of Solomon's failing to be obedient to God. The Northern Kingdom, very confusingly, this button is very sensitive. Did I say this button is very sensitive? In the North, there was the Kingdom of Israel, very confusing because it had been the nation of Israel. In the South, the Kingdom of Judah. By the way, you'll notice something down here, the Nabatu tribes. We're going to talk about the Nabataeans later at this, this trip. Solomon dies, the kingdom is divided. In 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire destroys the northern kingdom of Israel, and the scripture says it's because of their sin. And then in 586, the southern kingdom of Judah is destroyed by Babylon. By the way, Judah is where we get the word Jew, because when the, Ju uh, the kingdom of Judah existed, that's all that was left. The northern tribes were the ten lost tribes of Israel, and they were taken off into captivity and not heard from. Um, the Babylonian exile in 586, when the Judah was taken off into captivity, was very traumatic for the Jews. They ended up saying, because the Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, they took them off into captivity out of uh, the promised land, as they understood it, and the Jews were left asking themselves, 
is Yahweh God. Yahweh, the four-letter proper name of God, we're told in the Hebrew Bible, the tetragrammaton, if you want to use the technical term, they had to say, is our God Yahweh not really the true powerful God that we think he is? Is he not more powerful than the Babylonian gods? They asked themselves, does God no longer love us or does he no longer accept us as his chosen people? They had to say, how do we keep being the people of God? In fact, how do we be a people at all when everything we had that we thought identified us as a people and as a religion has been taken from us? The promised land is gone, the temple is gone. This was when they developed the, uh, really developed the synagogue system. You all are aware of synagogues as the place of prayer and study amongst Jewish people. Well, without the temple, a place where they could have sacrifices, the focal point of their religion, they developed these synagogues as places of study, which is why study has always been so important to the Jews, of prayer and of um, gathering for community. They said, how do we worship without a temple? Well, the answer was the synagogue system. That's how they kept from being assimilated into a foreign culture, the way the northern kingdom had been. And this was what developed Judaism. This is called a rabbinic period. And rabbinic Judaism is what came after the Babylonian exile. So in 538, after only about 50 or 60 years of being in captivity, King Cyrus of Persia conquers the Babylonians and he tells the Jews they can go home. They can go back to Israel. And that was the return, the great return. Then Alexander the Great again comes along in 300s and he conquers all of the Persian Empire, spreads Greek influence, and there's a great confusion amongst the Jews about those who wanted to accept the Jewish or the, the Greek influence and speak Greek and those who wanted to stay true to the original Hebrew ideas. In fact, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees represented the Hellenized or the Greek kind of Jew and the Pharisees being the more Hebraic Jews. So many Jews started speaking Greek that in very short order they no longer knew how to read Hebrew. They couldn't even read their own Bible, which is why in the third century, 70 scholars were taken from Jerusalem down to Alexandria to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, which is what we have as the Septuagint, so that people could read their own holy works. Now yeah, I'm going to roar through some of this. We have Herod the Great coming along at this time. Herod the Great, by the way, was not Jewish. He was Idumean. He came from down here in the south, but the Romans put him in charge, and so Herod the Great, of course, during the time of Jesus that you're aware of. The last great prophet of God was Malachi, and that was in the 400s BC, and after Malachi, God was silent, and the Jewish people were saying, where is God? They had um, a lot of Greek influence. I mentioned the Pharisees were the set-apart ones that didn't want to accept the Greek influence. The Sadducees did. You had Essenes, who were an apocalyptic cult, and then the Zealots, uh, who were those who were trying to fight the Romans. The Jewish people had, since the very first um, writings um, of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible, expected a Messiah one who would be in the line of David to come and save them and make them a great people again. Palestine in Jesus' time, as I said before, was the center of so much of the world. Uh, politically and culturally, it was exactly the right time for a new religion to come along. They had the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, so that there wasn't violence around that part of the world. They had Roman roads so that you could travel from place to place. You didn't have to have a passport because it was all Roman. And they had the Greek language. Everybody spoke Greek. It was a perfect time for a new religion to come along, especially because the people needed a new message of hope. Again, they wanted a God they could relate to. You even had a lot of Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people, who wanted to believe in one God. They were tired of this idea that the Roman gods and the Greek gods, they wanted to have a relationship with God. They were really ready to believe in one God, but unfortunately, most of the men were not prepared to do what was necessary to become a Jew. They didn't want to have to cut off part of their anatomy. And so the idea of Christianity coming along and saying you can believe in the one God and not have to become Jewish was a great idea to them. And so Jesus, the Christ, or Messiah, Christ is the Greek word for the anointed one, Messiah is the Hebrew word. He comes along 4 to 6 BC, the old calendars have got it wrong, it's somewhere between 4 and 6 BC, and lived for about 33 years. The Bible of the Christian faith, of course, is the Hebrew Bible, what the Christians call the Old Testament, and the New Testament, or the Gospels and the stories of uh, Christ's work in the New Testament. 
The Apostle Paul was primarily responsible for spreading this faith from Jerusalem. He actually was from, uh, from uh, Tarsus. Jerusalem through all of Asia Minor and over into Europe, into the, the Greece and Macedon. This was the state of the Christian faith in about 565, all of the yellow part. The green line represents the Roman Empire. So it went outside the Roman Empire in the 500s. Then in 570, and I'm going to mention this very quickly because I'm going to do a whole talk about not only the children of Abraham, but a talk on just Islam. 570 is born the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad, when he was 40 years old, began to have visions from God that he saw as being a corrective to the mistakes that had been made by Judaism and Christianity. Judaism and Christianity were believed to be revealed religions, but that they had corrupted the scripture, they had gotten the faith wrong, and so Muhammad was sent as the last prophet, according to Islamic belief, to straighten them out. The growth of Islam in during Muhammad's lifetime, all of this orange area here, it spread throughout most of the Arabian Peninsula. The next four caliphs or successors that came after him, they're called the Rashidun or the right guided caliphs, the successors. They were responsible for spreading uh, Islam to all of these areas. And then the next group went all the way up into Spain and Portugal and threatened France, the Kingdom of the Franks. They took over all the way over into Western India, what we know of as Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. That's why those are Muslim countries today. We're going to talk in more detail about that later. And so this, at its greatest extent, is what Islam looked like. All of the Iberian Peninsula in Europe, all of North Africa, which had been one of the strongholds of Christianity, Obviously, the, the uh, Arabian Peninsula, all the way over into the edges of India and up here. Later on, this, this area here that's the lighter color was the Byzantine Christian Empire. Later on, Islam would take over all of that. And for a hundred years, they were at the gates of Vienna in Austria. This is what it looks like now in terms of world religions. The darker green is Protestantism, the lighter green is Catholicism, the darker blue is Sunni Islam, which is 85% of the Muslim belief, the lighter blue is uh, Shia Islam, and then you get here the Asian religions of various colors, some of this brown in between are mixtures of like tribal religions and Christianity and others. This is how the world has developed religiously, I've almost taken the full hour up. But we're going to break that down in terms of the Abrahamic religions and talk about Islam, and I'll try to talk a little slower. I knew I had too much material when I started this, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Are there any questions that I can answer for you right now? So you, you know everything there is to know, then, right? Anything particular that you... Yes? This is a simple question. Do you believe Jesus spoke Greek at that time did Jesus speak Greek at that time period? Yes, he would have. Actually, the common language then was Aramaic, because Aramaic was related to the Babylonian language. 500 years before Jesus, they had been in exile in Babylon. And so Aramaic was a version of the Babylonian language, which was the common street language. But Greek was the language that you used in terms of any kind of formal interaction, and that's following um, uh, Alexander the Great's conquest. But then Hebrew was the religious language. But as we said, by the time of Jesus, there were a lot of Jews who had forgotten how to speak Hebrew or how to read it, which is why 250 years or so before Jesus, they had had to translate the Bible into, into Greek for them. Okay? So most of the people then would have spoken two or three languages at least. Other questions? Again, we're going to break this down and give you a little more detail. I know I ripped through this stuff pretty quickly. All right, if you do want to ask me a question afterwards, I'll be available. Thank you very much for your time.